Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk, as we continue in our study of the prophet Amos. And on behalf of Alice and Mark and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are blessed that you can join us for time in the Word. Time fellowship electronically is not as good as face-to-face, I'll tell you the truth, but we'll take it. 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 We'll take it. Amen. So we're going to continue on. This is our fourth study in the prophet Amos. And we've actually gotten into the second chapter already. Hallelujah. So before we start and continue on there, Brother Mark is going to ask God's blessing on our time together in God's word. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for this day. And we thank you for your word. And just bless this time so we can get out of your word what you want us to get out of it. And... Apply it to our lives and our hearts. Amen. 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 And Father, let nothing come out of my mouth that you've not put in my heart. That's right. All right. Um, We actually read verses four. We read the, as we closed last, in our last program, our last study, um, we had looked at the judgment upon the nations. And then in closing, we mentioned that the next would be God's word, prophetic word, to his own people, first in Judah, and then in Israel, where God has sent Amos. Remember, Amos is from the south, and God has sent him up the north to Israel to prophesy. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start at Amos chapter 2, verse 4. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, Because they rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes, their lies also have led them astray, those after which their fathers walked. Now, I had mentioned last week in all of of these prophecies to all of the nations, that term is used about its punishment. God is bringing its punishment. And I mentioned the fact that in the actual Hebrew here, that those words don't appear. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an assumption that it's punishment. It can also be correction, all right? And there's a difference. Um, The purpose of punishment is to inflict a penalty for wrong action. Does that sound reasonable? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. But God's ultimate purpose is to disciple. Right. To teach, to reprove, to correct, and to train in righteousness. That's what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16. That's what his desire is, right? Because God, who sent the Son Jesus into the world to bring life, eternal life, expressed his purpose through the apostle Peter when he wrote, The Lord is not slow about his promises, some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3.9 Right? So God's desire is that none should perish, but all come to life, eternal life, by repenting. So now that punishment is about bringing, basically bringing the wrath of God on somebody, right? right? But correction, repentance, is a gift from God. Punishment is always self-inflicted. Now, by self-inflicted, I don't mean that you're, you know, God's cause, but you're the root cause. Punishment, if you're being punishment, you're the cause of being punished. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's it's always been man's fallen nature since Adam sinned in the garden. The first thing he did, I mean, here, here, can you picture, here's Adam, the woman, and God, and Adam is saying, He's blaming everybody. Blaming everybody but himself. The woman, you made. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, and it's, it's our fallen human nature to cast the blame wherever we can, but to avoid it on ourselves, right? Repentance and correction require that we accept and assume the blame for our own actions, right? Mm-hmm. So when I say punishment is self-inflicted, it's because you you have chosen to disobey God. Right. Yeah. You, it's a choice. Because you know that there's consequence to disobedience. Right. Because we get to choose the blessing or the curse. Yeah. Deuteronomy 28, that's what it says. We get to choose life or death. That's what it says in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. 
we get to choose who we will serve. The Lord God Almighty, who is love, or the idols that were left behind in Egypt and the idols of the land in which we live. That's what Joshua said when he spoke to the people of God and said, choose you this day. Who are you going to serve? Choose who you're going to serve. You're either going to serve the Lord God or you're going to serve, and that's what he was talking about, the gods of the world, all right? So it's about that choice. But Jesus clearly stated, no one can serve, no one, no one no. can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. Mm -hmm. Right? That's when he was talking about wealth. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mm -hmm. Matthew 6, 24. If you will hate one and love the other, be devoted to one and despise the other, think about what he said next. They rejected the law of the Lord and not have, have not kept his statutes. Now the King James, I, I'm reading from the New American Standard, okay? I, the King James translate that, that part of this verse as they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments. Now, I think it's a much more revealing translation, and I'm convinced it's a much more accurate portrayal of both the heart and the mind of God, all right? Because if you reject the word, you're despising the word, of course. right? And that's what it says in the King James, okay? Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus said when he talked about the fact you can't serve two masters. You're going to love one and despise the other. If a person does not keep the Lord's commandments, he or she has not just rejected, but despised God's statutes. They have despised Jesus. Mm -hmm. He is the word of God. Yes. He is the word who has made flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, John chapter 1. He is the word. Mm -hmm. To reject his word is to re reject, reject Jesus. Him. To reject him is to, to despise, despise him. Mm -hmm. This is not a game. This is serious stuff. And that's why I remember, you know what's happening here? Amos was not sent north to teach the people, but to fulfill the role of a prophet. prophet right. And as Jeremiah would say a little later on, he said, and I think we started in the introduction with this verse in Lamentations chapter 2, verse 14. Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions, and they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity, but they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. There have been too many false prophets all throughout the history of the, of the, the people of God, all right? Mm -hmm. So the purpose of a prophet was to expose their iniquity. Not to give them that choice. Right. Because once your iniquity is exposed, once you're confronted with your iniquity, you must choose whether you're going to excuse it or you're going to repent of it. And you've probably heard me say this before. If you excuse, if you make excuses, they are, excuses are, the fiery arrows shot from the pits of hell to kill repentance. Satan desires that you don't repent. And he gives you a way out. Make an excuse, okay? But it says, continues on in that verse to say, their lies have led them astray. You know, that's <clears throat> very, very simple when you consider it, when you think about it, right? In John 8, 31, 32, and I'm, you know, you've probably heard these verses many times. Jesus was therefore saying to those Jews, believers, I mean, this is the people of God, right? Mm -hmm. Those Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay? Yeah. How are you going to know the truth? Well, God's word, his word is holy, pure, and true. And abiding in it will cause you to know the truth. But the Lord is saying through the prophet Amos to his people, to his people in Judah now, right? that they had rejected and despised his word. No word, no truth. Now, I want to tell you, this is a, this is a timely message. It always is. The word of God always is. And it's also a timely call. When we started this whole series some time ago now, in search of Christianity, the idea was that this is a time 
that we should be examining ourselves to see if we are living, walking, believing according to the Word of God. Because if we're not, we're in serious trouble. Yes. Okay. Yes. In these days, I, the truth is hard to find. We live in a world filled with propaganda. Mm -hmm. Absolutely filled with propaganda. Every commercial you see, every billboard you see, every advertisement in a newspaper, the purpose of that is to change the way you think. Yes. That's the purpose of advertising. Mm -hmm. It's also the purpose of everything the devil does. Yes. He wants to change the way you think. He wants to make you think against the Lord. But I have to tell you something. God, it's not propaganda. Because propaganda is the, always the truth. God propaganda. wants to change the propaganda. way we think. Isn't so, always, no, propaganda what? isn't always the truth. Propaganda is always not the truth. That's it. Correct. Thank you ever so much. Thank you ever so much. Because its purpose is to lead you into that lie and lead you by a lie. Okay? Jesus, his purpose is to change our minds also. That we would be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Taking thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. So that we would put on the mind of Christ and walk in truth. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something. The world doesn't have it. The world does not have truth. No. The word is truth. Should I say it or do you want to say it? There is the word and there is the world. And there is an L of a difference. That's right. Right in the middle. Right in the middle is a big L. It stands for lie. Okay. What's going on in the world around us today? I mean, please be on the alert. Be aware. Your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion. We are living in, I always say, listen, we're living in exciting times. Yeah. We are blessed to live in exciting times. But we are also living in the times that Paul said are the perilous last days. And there is peril. And the tool of the devil is the lie. It's only tool he has. He's been disarmed. Okay? He was publicly disarmed. So, after Jesus said this about if you abide in the word, you're going to know the truth and the truth will make you free. Mm -hmm. He went on to say to those same Jews, and he, they, they were boasting about the fact that they were Abraham's offspring. Yes. You see, they thought that their religious background and heritage was what caused their relationship with God. It can never do that. Relationship with God is always personal, and it has to be a personal choice that you make, all right? Mm -hmm. So while they're boast about being the Abraham's offspring, but we're opposed to the teaching of Jesus Christ, Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. John 8, 44. This is the one that the Apostle John wrote in 1 John 5, 19. He said, this world is in his, in his hand, in his power. That liar by nature, the father of lies. So it is the father. When it says the father, that's because he gives birth. To all lies, right? If something is not true, it, it came from Satan. Yes. You know, you can try and pin it down and say, well, it came from this news or that news. Or it the fact of the matter is, Satan is the father of lies. They all come from him. It's Satan who gives birth to all lies, and it was those who chose wrong, who accepted the lies of the adversary and then made their own choices. It was... They made they also made their own lies, all right? Because remember, this verse says that they're being led by the lies of the, the, their own lies, mm -hmm. and the lies basically came down from their fathers, right? And if it was bad then, mm -hmm. and it was, consider Paul's words about the perilous last days. When he says in 2 Timothy 3.13, he said, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's lies. Yes. That's the tool. That's the tool. But it's going to go from bad to worse. You know, interestingly, I read a report in the news this morning about a, a, a new Gallup survey, new Gallup poll. Mm -hmm. And it, it revealed that just 
just under 25% of all Americans believe that the Bible is the word of, inaccurate word of God, or inaccurate, the accurate, infallible word of God. Less than 25% of all Americans. You want to know why this country is in the shape it's in? I could say that it, I could say that they have rejected his word and his commands. But to be honest, if you look at the culture around us, I would have to say they have despised mm. his word and his command. Okay? Less than 25% believe that the Bible is true. And in this country, as in most, lack of knowledge and understanding lead to a lack of wisdom and, and to so many religious people who, as Paul also prophesied in that second letter to Timothy, would be holding to a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Mm -hmm. That's what we're seeing, 2 Timothy 3, 5. Religion's not disappearing, although it's, it is on the down. But religion's going to be great at the end, because you know what? Everybody's going to worship the Antichrist. That's right. There's going to be a gigantic, quote-unquote, revival, mm -hmm. when people will become phenomenally religious. But these people, were they, they were holding to a form of godliness, although they denied the power. Is that a heritage? Well, this verse seems to imply that it is. Doesn't it? Yes. Coming down from the fathers. To be perfectly blunt, the people of God have a fairly terrible history when it comes to being obedient to the Lord. Have you ever read the Bible? Mm -hmm. I mean... There's, not, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, the people... Why? Because... It's repetitive. It's well, you know, if you want to know, go read the beginnings of the, of the Gospel of John. You know, God the Father sent Jesus Christ into the world. Why? So that whosoever would believe in him would receive eternal life. But it says, you know, he's the light of the world. He came in bringing light, but men loved the darkness because they wanted to hide in their sin. They didn't want to be exposed, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's interesting too. In 47, he said, He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not. the devil. You are not of God. Yeah. You are the devil. Yeah, it's, so it's the hearing again. It, it, it is always the hearing. It's, it's interesting because this past Sunday at our little services, I spoke about the fact the foremost <clears throat> command, and, and this is worthy of thought. That, you know, take, just take this home with you and chew on it a little bit. When Jesus was approached and asked, what is the foremost command? What's, mm -hmm. What is the most important command of God? Well, what Jesus quoted was from Deuteronomy 6, chap chapter 6, verse 4. And in Hebrew, it starts, Shema, Shema Israel, Hear, O Israel. That's the most important command that you hear. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Mm -hmm. If you don't hear God, you're not going to have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And nothing else is going to fall into place. So we have to we have to hear the voice of God. If you're not if you're having difficulty hearing the voice of God, pray that He would dig out your ears, mm -hmm. that you would hear His voice, because that's His desire. And if you ask anything according to His will, you He'll hear it. He'll hear it, and He'll do it. And I think if you hear His voice, you will obey. Well, the problem is people turn a deaf ear mm -hmm. because you have to train your senses. That's what it says in Hebrews five fourteen. You have to train your hearing to tune into the voice of God in the midst of all of the noise in this current world. 87,000 television and radio channels screaming all the time. Right? So, as I said, the people of God have a, a really bad history of being obedient to God. And it's coming down from father to son, father to son. So, thank the Lord for his graciousness and the fact that our fathers can be changed. Mm. Now, I don't mean he's going to go back in time and change those fathers. Mm -hmm. I mean that you can change your father. This is the graciousness of God. Thank you, Lord. In a conversation with Nicodemus the Pharisee, John said, and I, uh, Jesus said, and it's in the Gospel of John, verse, chapter 3, starting at verse, verse 3, Jesus an answer, answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? 
Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. You must change fathers. Then it will be our father rather than their fathers. Okay? I mean, that's, that's the plan. That's the way it works. So, so think, how, go into the next, the next verse. Let's go into Amos 2, verse 5, right? Where God says, So I will send fire upon Judah, and it will consume the citadels of Jerusalem. This is God. Jerusalem is the city of God. Jesus loved Jerusalem. This is the place where he chose that the temple would be, be built that contained the Holy of Holies, the tabernacle, you know, his name, where his name would dwell. The center of the universe. The center of the universe. And yet here he's saying, I will send fire upon Judah and it will consume the citadels of Jerusalem. You know why? It's refiner's fire, baby. That's right. It's Re either... It's either Fire. It's either going to be cleansing fire or destructive fire. Yes. So it's going to consume, you know, okay? General William Booth, uh, you know of William Booth, right? The founder of the Salvation Army back in the late 1800s. In 1878, he wrote a wonderful old hymn entitled, Send the Fire. Oh, yeah. We've actually used that in some of the Bible bites. A, a friend of mine, a pastor up in Canada, who was in the Salvation Army, sang that song, Send the Fire. Yeah. So he was talking about the fire of the Holy Ghost, Booth was, when he wrote that song. Mm -hmm. As on the day of Pentecost, when brothers and sisters were gathered in one place and in one mind seeking the Lord. That is not what the Lord is speaking about here through Amos. It's like the choices that I spoke of earlier. All people will experience the fire of God. Get that straight. Right. All people will experience the fire of God. Either of destruction, as this verse foretells, or of the wonderful, mighty presence of our God, a loving God. So it's all about choice. Because it says in Hebrews 12, starting at 28, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. So this prophetic word from Amos was fulfilled about Judah. was fulfilled not terribly long after. When concerning Judah and Jerusalem, I'm going to read to you now from Jeremiah. It says, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all these nations round about. And I will utterly destroy them and make them a horror and a hissing and an everlasting desolation. desolation. Jeremiah 25, 8 and 9. Mm. This is God. This is God. But he doesn't bring to destroy. He brings to cleanse. But it's up to everybody to make the choice of whether it will be a destructive fire or a cleansing fire. Neither nations or individuals can disobey the sovereign Lord God without penalty or consequence. And there is only one way that the penalty and the consequence has any hope of being avoided. When John came forth to prepare the way of the Lord, he said, it's, or it says in Matthew 3. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching the wilderness, in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus came forth from the wilderness, remember being tempted by the, by the mm -hmm. devil, right? He started by saying, From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4.17. When Jesus spoke in the, in the last days, the book of Revelation, to the churches, and I just mentioned a few here, to the church at Ephesus, he said, Remember therefore from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first. 
to Pergamum, the church of Pergamum. He said, repent therefore, or else I'm coming to you quickly and will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. To Sardis, he said, remember therefore what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. And finally, to the church at Laodicea, he said, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Revelation 3.19. I just want to tell you, and I said this when we started this study, there's a difference between teaching and prophecy. Yes. Teaching is good. I mean, God has appointed teachers in the church. Mm -hmm. If I didn't believe in teaching, we wouldn't <clears throat> be doing any of these Bible studies. But the simple matter is, I believe we are coming to that time when, when the focus is prophetic. And the prophetic call is always repent. It's not about, oh, you're going to have a nicer car, a nicer job, a nicer house, a nicer spouse. Mm -hmm. No. You know what it is? It is a call to repentance. We need, this, this study has always been about that we examine ourselves. We examine ourselves to see, to test and see that wrong. we are doing what God <clears throat> has called us to do. That our lives are lining up with the teaching of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And if they are not, we need to fall on our face and repent and get clear. These are the perilous last days. I don't, I don't want to, you know, I, I, okay, I, we're running out of time, but I, I'm, so I'm going to start, we're going to go into, next we're going to start talking about Israel, okay? So let me just read Amos 2.6, okay. now I'll come back to it. Till I, in Amos 2.6, now it's one from Judah, and now he's speaking about Israel. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. Because they sell the righteous for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. Now, when we get into this in the whole book of Amos, a lot of people say, well, this is about a social gospel. Mm -hmm. It is not a social gospel. It is the gospel. That's right. And God's word covers every aspect of life, from the womb to the tomb and beyond. I mean, every, every aspect of life. That's why God inspired Peter to write in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. He said, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. God has put a call on our lives. You choose to accept it or you choose to reject it. We all know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever will. You, if you're hearing this for the first time, you better. You have to make a choice. If you don't make a choice, you most assuredly have, have made, made a choice. choice. That's right. <laughs> okay? I am telling you. sit on the fence. Choose, choose God. Choose Jesus. Choose life. It is a joy-filled, abundant life, regardless of what the world does. Amen. So we'll get into this more in our next program next week. We want you to join us then and tell somebody else. Amen. Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you that we can come together in your word, Lord God. And I pray that you would indeed open the ears of our hearts, Lord God, the eyes of our heart, that we would see wonderful things in your word, that we would be drawn to you to be more and more like you in Jesus' name. God bless you and goodbye till next time. Bye. So I cherish that old rugged cross till my trophies of the best I may die. I will play.